Okay, let's unpack this. You've asked us to deep dive into the winter 2025-2026 polar vortex forecast. Definitely a topic that gets a lot of chatter, a lot of noise. So our mission today, cut through that, see what the early signs are really telling us and uh, what it might actually mean for you. Yeah, exactly. And it's really important we clarify what we mean by polar vortex, isn't it? Because when we talk about it, we're mostly focused on that huge swirl of cold air way, way up in the stratosphere. Right, like 15 to 50 kilometers up that layer above our normal weather. Precisely, in the stratosphere. Now, people often use the term for any bad cold snap down here where we live in the troposphere. For sure, on the news all the time. Right, but its real significance, its power, is how changes way up there can actually connect downwards, really influencing the weather we experience. Okay, so that connection is key. And the sources we're looking at, they're pointing towards uh, what they call an almost perfect storm scenario. For a weaker polar vortex this coming winter, What's lining up to cause that? Well, it looks like a really powerful combination, a synergy of three big global climate drivers. First off, you've got ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Oh yes, El Nino and La Nina. That's the one. It's neutral right now, but the forecasts, they strongly lean towards either a weak La Nina developing or maybe just staying neutral right through winter 225, 2026. And historically, those conditions, they tend to favor a weaker polar vortex. Okay, so that's factor one. Then there's the QBO, the quasi-biennial oscillation. Sounds complex. It does, but the basic idea is alternating winds high up in the stratosphere near the equator. They switch direction roughly every two years or so. Quasi-biennial, okay. Exactly, and for this coming winter, 2025, 2026, we're seeing an easterly QBO phase strengthening. Now this is fascinating because that easterly phase, it acts like a critical modulator. It basically, um, makes it easier for energy waves from our lower atmosphere. Run with the trope. Yes, to travel upwards into the stratosphere. Think of them like ripples disturbing the flow. These waves can literally disrupt or kick that stable polar vortex, making it weaker and less organized. So the easterly QBO sort of opens the door for these disruptions. Mm -hmm. And a weaker vortex means the cold air can escape easier. Is that the idea? That's exactly it. The jet stream, which usually keeps the Arctic air penned in, gets all wavy and wobbly. Right. And that lets the cold air spill southwards. Now add the third factor, Arctic sea ice. Okay, how does sea ice play into this? Well, the pattern of sea ice is important. Right now, data shows a very low ice cover in the Barents and Kara Seas, that's north of Scandinavia and western Russia. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, almost record high ice over in the Sea of Okhotsk near Japan. This specific configuration low here, high there, is described as a, well, a textbook situation for encouraging a weaker polar vortex. And the easterly QBO amplifies this effect. It seems to, yes. That easterly QBO makes the atmosphere more sensitive to this specific sea ice pattern's influence. So it's not just one thing pointing towards a weaker vortex. It's that all three ENSO state, the easterly QBO, and this sea ice pattern are all aligning. They're independently favoring a weaker vortex and potentially boosting each other's impact. That's the almost perfect storm idea. Wow, okay. So the big question then, what does this potentially weaker wobbly vortex mean for us on the ground? Cold, snow, where? It definitely increases the probability of more dynamic winter weather, mm -hmm. more variability, potentially more extremes across North America and Europe. That often means colder temperatures, yeah, and increased snowfall in certain areas. For the US, for example, some modeling suggests colder in the Northwest, but other patterns often linked to the Atlantic point towards colder conditions, maybe for the Midwest and the East. So it's not a guarantee of cold everywhere. No, absolutely not. And that's crucial. Regional impacts can really vary. And these are forecasts of probability, not certainty. It just tilts the odds. We've definitely seen winters described like this before. I remember 2013, 2014 being called a polar vortex winter, and then the beast from the east in Europe in 2018. What did those teach us? Those are good examples. Even when they weren't all full-blown sudden stratospheric warmings, those really dramatic breakdowns of the vortex. Right, the really rapid warming events way up high. Yeah, even without those sometimes, those past events consistently brought long stretches of pretty extreme cold and often significant snow. And that puts huge pressure on, you know, infrastructure, energy grids, farming, public health. You really feel the impact then. Definitely. And the signals for this coming winter, 2025, 2026, they have similarities. So in the U.S., you might think about potential for blizzard conditions, say, Midwest or Northeast. Maybe agricultural impacts further south if the cold dives deep. Energy demand spikes. 
Europe, too, faces a higher risk of those severe cold snaps coming in from the east or northeast. It's about the intensity and, maybe more importantly, the duration of the cold. Okay, so summing this up, the exact day-to-day -day forecast is obviously still way out. But these early signs, this convergence of factors, ENS, QBO, sea ice, they're compelling. Mm. They strongly suggest a higher chance of a winter that's more, let's say, dynamic and potentially challenging than average. I think that's a fair summary. Understanding these big global drivers gives us valuable foresight. It's not about predicting a blizzard on a specific Tuesday in January. Right, it's not fortune telling. No, it's about assessing the probabilities, understanding the potential kinds of impacts we might need to be ready for. It allows for better preparation, thinking ahead. So reflecting on all this, what really stands out to you from this deep dive, and maybe for you listening, given these early signs and remembering what past dynamic winters felt like, what steps, if any, might you start thinking about for this upcoming season? Something worth mulling over.